Welcome to the show. It's me, John Park, and I've got a big, huge piece of text in front of my face. Uh, that's because something uh, went a little bit wrong with a uh, with one of my layers here, and I was trying to fix it underneath the scenes. But there it is. Uh, so let me uh, let me put that in the right place. Stand by. All right. Uh, that's a little hint, by the way, as to what today's coupon code is going to be. Okay, it's not a hint. That's it. That's the actual. That's the actual thing. That's coupon code. Uh, so welcome, and when I say welcome, I mean all of you, all viewers, and I also mean the people over here in our chat. Uh, we have our Discord chat as well as our YouTube chat. Hello, hello. Uh, hi, Dale Etchells. Welcome, Charles Burnford. Nice to see you all. Dave Odessa. Hello, hello. And uh, and there's our there's our Discord chat right there. If you want to join the Discord chat, by the way, if you're over on Facebook or Twitch or somewhere where there doesn't seem to be an active chat, then head on over to adafru.it slash discord. Look for the live broadcast chat channel. This is it right here. Uh, so thanks for, for stopping by and hanging out there in the chat. Discord's not just for live streams either. We've got help channels for a variety of projects and programming languages and topics, uh, as well as general chat, pet photos, all kinds of good stuff. So come on over to the Discord. What do we have now? Like 30-something thousand users or something like that in the, uh, in the Discord. I'm sure it says here somewhere, but I don't see it. Um, let's see. What else have we got going on? Well, I, I blew it earlier, but let me, let me fix this, and uh, how about I'll, I'll give it a color even. Uh, there's an appropriate... There's an appropriate color. Sure. Uh, that's the coupon code for today. If you want to get 10% off in the store... Head to adafruit.com, throw some products into your cart, uh, and on the way out, type in honeycomb. That'll get you 10% off the entire order on actual stuff. It won't work for software or gift certificates or subscriptions, but it is good for actual things. Uh, And that's good till about midnight East Coast time tonight, I think is when that deactivates. But uh, go find some cool stuff. We had some new products in the store. with the Ask an Engineer show last night. In fact, let me, let me jump over to my Chrome browser here for a second. What have we got going on in the store? If you look, if you head to Adafruit, uh, there's a section here called New Products. You can also click on Products dropdown and click New Products View All. You can also just type in adafruit.com slash new. And that'll show you what's new in the store. We had a new display here, a a revision of a display that now has the iSpy connection, ribbon connection to it. We've got uh, some micro connector crimping pliers if you're doing some really small crimping work. Uh, Coming soon, the M7, the Metro M7, that should be, I think, a handful of them in the store. 
sometime, maybe today or tomorrow. I'm guessing tomorrow, if it's not already there today. Uh, if you want, you can find out. Hit, hit more info and put your email address here. Click notify. You'll get an email when that really wildly powerful and capable Metro M7 uh, hits, the, hits the virtual shelf. You get 10% off on it if you, if you act quick when that comes out and you grab one. Uh, there's also this new uh, Pi Cowbell and Ada Logger for, for the Pi Pico. Uh, it's got a real-time clock, battery. I think it has a real-time clock. Yeah, real-time clock, battery, micro SD. So if you're locking, if you're logging uh, your your data, that's a, a, a nice one for those kinds of projects. Uh, so anyway, yeah. If you and you don't just need to get new stuff. You can you can head to products, click on a category, power. What can you get in power? You can get some cables. You can get some switches. You can get some solar stuff. All kinds of good things in the store. So type. Type in honeycomb, uh, and you'll get 10% off on that order. Let's see, what else is happening? Uh, I've got a show, speaking of new products, on Tuesdays. That's JP's product pick of the week. On the show, I like to grab something from the store and show it off and give you a big, humongous discount on it. Uh, So this week, it was this LCD character backpack. Super cool, nice revision, makes it way easier to work with because it's now got Stemma QT, so uh, just a small little set of connections to your microcontroller and then you can uh, you can run on, on uh, any of these 8x1, 16x2, 20x4. We have a number of different backpacks. Uh, and that was 50% off during the show. So those happen during the show only. Uh, no coupon code needed. Here is a little excerpt, one minute excerpt from yesterday's show. No, not yesterday's show, Tuesday's show. That's what it was. It is the LCD character backpack. I took our board, our little LCD driver board there, and put some socket headers on there. You can plug that in like that. Okay, so here you can see I've got four lines on this one. I've got some blinking cursor, which is part of the library. Uh, notice the J and P, those are a custom font, so I did a couple of custom letters. Uh, same with that little sort of Space Invader guy who's, uh, who's flying along on the bottom there. It's a custom, uh, so I filled three of the eight custom slots, and then you can just call them uh, using an address. Uh, here you can also see I'm doing some of the uh, sort of automated scrolling, uh, moving here. I'm using the little move right command, and then I'll I'll run this uh, set of text, and then you scroll to kind of move that off to the side and rearrange that. That's my product pick of the week this week. It is the LCD character backpack with I squared C and SPI and Stemma QT connectors. Yes, indeed it was. All right. Uh, and let us know if you put those into some projects. I'm curious. They've, they've got, uh, take a look at them. They've got some nice little uh, mounting holes in the corners there. You can make a little cutout and mount that inside of a panel. Look really cool. Uh, by the way, when I was looking through my parts for uh, the LCD displays to see if I, ha- if I had any uh, laying around, I found a really nice old kit here. Let me, let me put this on the overhead. This is a, uh, a blast from the past type of, type of item here. Uh, that was the 16 by 2 LCD shield kit. And uh, I have a built one right here. So I had one that I never put together. Uh, and here's one I did put together. So this was a similar type of idea. It's a, a backpack uh, for an LCD display but it is in Arduino shield form factor. So that plops down onto an Arduino board and lets you control the the LCD display as well as gives you a a number of buttons here, a little sort of D-pad and a select button. Uh, There's the little contrast potentiometer there. Uh, This is a reset for the Arduino there. So uh, I should fire that up. I should should grab an Arduino and fire that up. That's a, a kind of a cool oldie but goodie right there. Um, so sometimes I guess it pays to never clean out your parts drawers, even though those are pretty obsolete. They're, they're still kind of fun, kind of neat to play around with. Uh, all right, let's see the next thing we've got for you. Let me get set up here. I've got a, a nice little circuit Python parsec I'd like to share. Yeah. 
All right, so let me get set up here. Uh, grab my code window there so I can see that. Okay. For the CircuitPython Parsec today, I wanted to talk about using the color wheel from Rainbow I.O. So in CircuitPython, there is a library called Rainbow I.O. and it has this function called color wheel in it. It's a really convenient library to import so that you can run through the hue of a 360 degree color wheel uh, with just one variable or one value changing in order to change to any color on the rainbow. So here's how it works. You can see here I'm importing rainbow IO. I'm setting up my NeoPixels and the very first thing I do is I actually set them to color 200 on the color wheel. So if I resave this right now, you see the first thing it'll do is it'll pop up with red. Okay, so red is close to the top. This is a 0 to 255 color wheel. Uh, and then I'm setting up some ranges and a little segment variable that allows me to jump between positions on this color wheel. Uh, so the way that is done is simply with this leds.fill rainbow, rainbow wheel, and then a value. And that value is one of the positions along the color wheel. If I want to step smoothly through these, I'm going to say let's run through 255. So that's the entire rainbow of colors. And you'll see all of my NeoPixels here will sweep through. And I'm also printing out values there just for uh, a bit of information. So if you pay attention to those, you can see I'm turning that one number, which is 0 to 255, into a tuple just for display purposes so I can see what the red, the green, and the blue values would be. That's kind of a pain in the neck to try to interpolate between those three values. So if you want instead to really easily jump to values, you can use the color wheel. Uh, if you take a look at this, let's say with five segments on the color wheel. Now it's going to jump from position to position to position, running through sort of a coarse section of the color wheel here. here. Uh, and you can adjust that to be anything that you want. So you can use this on individual pixels. You can do some really nice rainbow swirl types of things. But I like it just for being able to have a really minimal bit of code that allows me to change any color of the rainbow on my NeoPixels. And so that is how you can use Color Wheel in Rainbow I.O. to adjust the hue of your NeoPixels in CircuitPython. And that's your CircuitPython Parsec. Um, yeah, so let me, let me jump into uh, a couple other specifics since I, I saw there was a comment from uh, DJ Devin 3. How the, um, the stepping is working here is this right here for J in range. So range you often will just step through the sort of minimum increment of one if it's a, uh, an integer type of thing you're stepping through. Uh, but you can actually give the range command uh, three arguments. So you can say a number you're starting on, a number you're stopping on, so the beginning and the end of the range, and then the third thing is the step size. So normally that's one, but if you want to skip to every tenth thing, you could type in 10 there. Um, you'll also notice if I, let's, let's set this to a pretty, a pretty fine uh, grain. So I'm going to say 85 steps. So we're going to be fairly smoothly interpolating uh, through the entire color wheel. Okay, so you can see we go red, then yellow, green. Okay, so if I just want to go halfway, if I want to stop when I get through to blue before I ever reach green, I can change what this end hue value is. So right now I have it stopping at 255, which is essentially uh, running all the way through the color wheel. If I say, uh, let's, let's say 126, so this should be about a halfway point, or 128 would be the, kind of the exact halfway point. Uh, so now you'll see it's going to stop. Oh, actually, sorry, it's, it sweeps this way. <laughs> I always forget the, uh, the direction is, uh, is opposite of what I sometimes think is sort of think of, of a pointer that's going counterclockwise through the wheel or the wheel is turning clockwise. Uh, but you can see I'm stopping at that halfway point. So I'm going red through yellow, green, blue, and popping up. So I'm never reaching those magentas. You could flip that and go to the other direction if you needed to, um, to run through the other side of the color wheel. Uh, 
And I'm always a fan of, of using hue. So there's a, a few different ways that you can use hue. Uh, color wheel just grabs hue. There are also ways to do hue saturation and value. So you can uh, change how much of that color is mixed in and how bright it is. Uh, but the typical use is full saturation and just running through, uh, through particular points on the color wheel. Um, you can see, by the way, in the graphic that I threw up here, uh, I tend to think of the color wheel as 0 to 360 degrees, so I, I wrote some of those numbers on the inside there, a little, little faded. Um, but you, with, with the uh, color wheel inside of Rainbow O, you have to think of 0 to 255. So um, it's just an adjustment if you're, if you're used to thinking in degrees. All right. So we can stop that running there. Uh, and this, by the way, is, I've just got a Circuit Playground... Blue fruit here, and we had an LED bulb, um, LED sort of spotlight light bulb in the house die, and I cracked the diffuser off of the top of it, so it makes makes for a kind of a, a nice diffuser to throw on top of some NeoPixel stuff. Um, all right, so let me unplug that and set that off to the side there. Uh, right. So next up, okay, I wanted to give a, uh, a little update, super brief update, in fact, on my Meow uh, MIDI project. So the, the cat I am uh, turning into the, the cat keyboard, I'm turning into the MIDI keyboard. Uh, I'm in the middle of painting it right now. So you can see it's in pieces. Um, the keyboard was originally sort of off-white. You can see it there, kind of a, a warm off-white. So I just primed it and sprayed it with white, uh, and I hit it with some um, sealant. And these, uh, the black keys were actually brown, so I've hit those again with some uh, primer, black spray paint, few coats, and some glossy uh, primer on there. So those will look Nice, like that, like a typical piano keyboard. Uh, just to partly differentiate this from my line-out Miazic project, I am making this one look a little more like a MIDI keyboard, typical MIDI keyboard. So uh, Kat has gotten a bunch of uh, coats of primer. Uh, I made some mistakes, had to do some sanding, some more primer, some more paint. Um, mistakes, sanding, paint, but it's never gonna look perfect. Um, especially because I was doing this in somewhat windy conditions and getting little bits of dust on it and stuff outside. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's the, uh, the main um, body of the cat there, or face of the cat. Cone, too, is going to be black. I'm going to give it the, uh, the nose is black. I'm going to leave some of the buttons, uh, the blue and purple ones, but I didn't want to keep any of that orange and yellow in there. Uh, so that uh, set of buttons, these were the buttons that were either yellow or orange, um, these I'm gonna do, I think, in a uh, sort of day glow neon acid green. Um, and I may do uh, some sort of slitty eyes on the cat too. Um, more cat eye shaped eye pupil that's also the neon green. Um, there's actually a coat. At one point I was masking this and doing white primer and then the, the green paint here, but then I had uh, trouble masking it properly when I went to get black, so I kind of screwed all that up. So uh, I may scrape away black and discover green under there that may work well enough and then seal it, uh, or I may make like a little vinyl sticker or something to put on there. Um, I think I'm going to resist doing NeoPixel underlighting LED stuff, I think, but, but maybe not. We'll see. Um, but this will this will look kind of cool. These will like I said, these will probably be green. It also kind of looks good with the, the white and black. Um, gives him a, a slightly more formal look for, for your MIDI cat. Um, and then I'll also paint the bottom uh, underside of, of the base of it also black. Um, and then integrate my uh, thing I was working on last week with the accelerometer uh, into the ice cream cone there. So that'll be attached with the cabling. Uh, and it smells like spray paint in here, even though this was all painted outside just 
the fact that some of it's still drying a little bit even after a day it means it's off gassing some delightful uh, spray painty fumes, which is not, not a lot of fun. Um, so that's, that's the only update I have on that, uh, and I'm working on the guide for that. Uh, code is up if you want to look uh, in the learn repo uh, up on the Adafruit GitHub. You can, you can find the, uh, the code for that. Uh, someone said he looks more like Lars now, the, uh, the cat. I don't know if that, is that a compliment for the poor cat? Okay, so on to uh, the, the new project, the next project. Uh, I had shown this a little bit on show and tell last night, um, and I showed the process as I was working on this. Let me go to the down shooter here. And this is the PCBs that I got in for the chalk keyboard or uh, key switches. So these are the little low profile chalk key switches. Um, we didn't have a footprint for those uh, for fritzing and we don't have a, a breakout for these right now in the Adafruit store. So uh, I was able to use uh, kind of a combination of uh, the data sheet and measuring stuff uh, in Rhino. I came up with a really good um, proper footprint and model, and then I was able to uh, export some of that stuff over to the uh, kind of combination of Illustrator and Inkscape. You could do it all in Inkscape. As I found out, Illustrator had some issues with how it exported the SVG um, that, that gave me trouble. So it may be better just stick to Inkscape for, for building a fritzing part. Um, I also just got these in. So these are, at the same time, I had made a little breakout um, for an individual one. So these won't fit onto a breadboard or a permaproto, um, but this will. So this gives us standard 0.1 inch spacing to go into a, uh, into a breadboard. And it also has... Uh, I don't have a spare one here, do I? No. Uh, we've got the reverse mount NeoPixels. Uh, you can see some right there. So those solder on as uh, SMD parts onto the bottom there, and you can kind of, in the reflection there, or in the specular highlight, you can see my uh, uh, traces there running up to these. So this breaks it out into, what, five pins? One, two, three, four, five, six pins. Um, so that we can do uh, data in, data out, power and ground for the NeoPixel, and then the uh, ground and switch pin for the, um, the switch. And you could combine, I could have combined these, but just got lazy and didn't as far as the two grounds go. Um, there might be reasons not to, but. So this, um, thanks Todd. So the, uh, the breakout's looking good. Yeah, so this, this means that, uh, I haven't even tried one of these yet, but uh, presumably it works. You solder uh, these down, and these are actually really, I got both, I have two different, I, I sent these to JLC PCB and these to Oshpark, uh, both of which the tolerances are, are excellent, and my um, pins really kind of press fit into there nicely. Uh, I'm sure these would work even without soldering them. At least one of those pins is like in there really nice and tight without being a, a problem, I think. Um, so then solder on the, uh, the NeoPixel there and then go to town uh, for, for developing. These uh, switches, you can see they have a nice window knocked out there for the, the NeoPixel to glow through. So you get a lot of light up through the top of there. Um, it's kind of unavoidable that you'll, you'll never get the keycaps glowing from the middle outward because even on um, these type of MX style uh, key switches, the LED always favors one side there. You can see the, the LED there uh, glowing up through the, the top of the thing. Even though some of these stems are kind of glowy, uh, it helps a little bit of light diffusion, you won't get it uh, centered. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so let's see, the um, issue that I ran into, and I, and I mentioned this on the, uh, the show and tell last night, is that in making the fritzing part, I um, worked really hard to try to make a single part in fritzing that works on the PCB as 
the through holes that you need for uh, the key switch and the SMD pads that you need for um, the NeoPixel. So Fritzing does not like that. Fritzing really, really, really wants that to be two parts. Um, in the interface in Fritzing, if you try to use this part that I made, it will keep trying to connect traces up to some pad that isn't a pad that's in the middle just because it got really confused about um, bottom side SMD pads and through holes being in one part. So uh, this is the PCB that I had made. Uh, it has problems. I made it, I, I finished it late at night, didn't pay too much attention. I missed uh, the fact that it did not connect a bunch of my grounds to ground pads, so I had to go bodge that stuff. I'll show you the embarrassing bodging in a second. Um, and the other issue is that the, I made, this is not Fritzing's fault. This was, I think, me not paying enough attention uh, as well as outputting the SVG file from um, Illustrator instead of Inkscape. Illustrator, I set the stroke to none. Um, it ignored that. So it could just be which SVG export I, I picked. Uh, it set the stroke on these holes to be some tiny number. They ended up getting plated. Uh, so you can see these are just mounting holes here for, for the plastic parts of the switch. Those have uh, plating in them. No big deal. This hole here is the cutout for the uh, NeoPixel. Now normally, if you look at uh, the part here that Lamore made in Eagle, uh, for, this is one of our little um, breakouts, NeoPixel breakout, uh, or NeoQ breakout. There's a nice little rectangular cutout there in the PCB. It's really painful to try to do that in fritzing in a PCB. Uh, so instead I just made a four millimeter circle, which actually works great. These, um, you can probably see it like this, these NeoPixels fit really nicely in there. Um, the problem is my pads are so close to those that when I put, put together the board with seven NeoPixels, one of them had a short between the data out and ground, I think it was. Um, or data in and ground. So I couldn't figure out if this one pixel wasn't working. I managed to realize that was the problem, desoldered it a little, moved it a little, resoldered it, and, and it worked out. So I'll show you that one lit up in a second. Um, so I got some great help from a forum member on the Fritzing forum named Van Epp. Uh, showed me settings in the SVG file, which is an XML. You can just edit it by hand. So I just went, went in. He made a part that fixed a bunch of stuff, and then I went in and, and uh, updated my part. I was able to remove that stroke that's around that. So it would, it would be a proper fill. Uh, it means that the board house won't, uh, won't try to copper plate that. So uh, the other update I made is I realized these little reverse mount NeoPixels, let me show them, uh, let me show you one of these in the store. Uh, let me find my browser. What are these called? SK. SK what? Is that not their name? I think just reverse mount NeoPixel will find it. Reverse, yeah. SK6812. Uh, these are actually kind of symmetrical. These don't favor being on the bottom of the board or the top of the board. Um, maybe you're not supposed to do it that way, but I, on my next revision of this PCB, which is coming on Monday, I just placed those SMD pads on the top. It actually made life a lot easier as far as fritzing, uh, letting me work with, with the part. So uh, the NeoPixels will go in in the top solder. There is no problem. There's plenty of clearance with these, uh, these switches here. So I don't, I don't think there'll be a problem. And the uh, NeoPixel basically sits in the same spot. It's just you know, slightly higher or slightly lower uh, depending on where you mount it. But since the, this is the body of the LED and here's the legs coming out, it's, it's basically the same. It's gonna be off by whatever the thickness of the, the board is there, 1.6 millimeters or something. So um, I think it'll work out. Someone tell me in the chat if you've, if you've got a concern with that. Of course, there's always making sure I get it not flipped and, and all that, but I, now I'll have the silk screen on the front. It was actually kind of um, tricky for me to get the silk I wanted on the back of it. So anyway, 
lots of uh, lots of little fun. Let me show you the bodging that that took place. So here is, um, oh yeah, thanks. Todd in the chat said this is specific to the SK six eight one two Mini E, um, which is this particular package made for like reverse mount through hole or through the through the cutout and all that. Um, yeah, DJ, the, 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 I wish I had one here, but I don't think I have any of them here. But if you looked um, at, let me switch to this down cam here. Uh, if you look at that, Part right there. This is actually, I think, the one I had to fix by lifting it up away from, from the board a little bit. Here's, here's one that's normal. Uh, that is kind of sunk halfway down into the board and, and halfway protruding, so it'll just be the you know, other way. Um, so here's what this looks like. So right now, uh, I am just using standoff here so I don't waste this uh, cutie pie on what turned out to be kind of a problematic board. So uh, eventually that, that cutie pie will sit nearly flush. I didn't do the castellated pads thing. I was never, not even going to bother trying to do that in fritzing. I think that would be possible for sure, but um, it, it would be taxing for me. So um, that won't be goofy like that. That'll be pretty close to flush um, sitting on the board. So if you take a look here, let me see how close I can get. Um, so you can see, here's a nice example of it. Uh, I believe this right here was islanded. So this what I thought was my ground plane, I had accidentally made an island, so that means uh, this ground on the, uh, the switch was touching nothing. Um, so I scraped away solder mask and soldered a single little bodge wire, like a strand of wire across to another little scrape away, and that gave this whole little, um, little ground pad here uh, a connection into the ground. Same with this one, so I just ran that again over a little trace there uh, so that this guy wasn't islanded. Um, so that was, the, that was pretty much the main bodging was, was just, uh, you can see here's another one here. So I, I made problems all for myself all over the place and it was just because I was doing it at like one in the morning or something like that, which is a bad idea. Um, so I, I just hand wired a bunch of the grounds around. Um, you can see this is one of the trickier areas here is the overlap of uh, the cutie pie with all these mounting holes uh, and traces and things. And there's some unnecessary stuff here. I don't need these, these um, USB pins that are in the, the PCB part for the cutie pie and fritzing. I should go and delete those because those are actually part of the cutie pie board. They shouldn't be on, on a PCB footprint um, for where it goes, but luckily they didn't ruin anything. Um, let's see, Seagrover says, could, have, could you have used small through hole pads instead of surface pads? Would be able to mount the Neo on top or bottom? Uh, I think that was a, uh, thank you for the suggestion. I think that was another case where Fritzing hated me when I used through hole pads um, for that part. Oh, no, 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 I'm wrong. There was this case where it tried to make this like magical pad that had no drill hole, but acted like it was like just solid copper running straight through. Um, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't like a via or a hole. It was, it was, it made a part that, that it was really mad at me about. And so that was making like selection and the UI go crazy. So, uh, but yes, I see what you're saying. You, you maybe could just do a through hole, regular old through hole uh, part to turn that all into a single part. That's a neat suggestion. I may, I may look at that. Um, <laughs> OPE says, looks like you're in the process of making your PCB into a proto board. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> but um, provided I didn't ruin anything just now, like touching stuff, uh, this 
does work. And, and when I uh, first put this together without paying attention to all the, the mistakes I had made on the PCB, it actually, um, I think most of the LEDs were connected to ground and working. Uh, it was some of the switches, or a large number of the switches that weren't. Uh, also, this is kind of tilted at a funny angle right now, just because, again, I have that uh, goofy amount of header stuff right there. So let me uh, find a USB cable and plug this in. And I can give you the tour of it. Uh, both functionally, uh, what I've got the the board doing and uh, as far as MIDI stuff goes. Not as easy to find a USB-C cable as I thought. There's one. Okay, so uh, this unfortunately is pretty light and the uh, cable is going to drag it around because I forgot my little, um, yeah, I'll just weigh down the cable with something. There we go. Okay, so I can turn that exposure down a little bit something like that. Uh, and let me turn down the sound first. Okay, so here you can see uh, it's registering the seven button presses on the Cutie Pie, uh, just as individual GPIO. So each of those, um, each of those switches runs to a Cutie Pie GPIO, uh, and then one of the GPIO pins on the Cutie Pie runs to, I forget which one, maybe this, this uh, NeoPixel first, and then they uh, go di data in to data out, to data in to data out, all the way through. Um, so it's a single NeoPixel strand, essentially. Um, the um, Color stuff I have going on here, I just have it, anything that gets pressed goes to magenta and then returns to uh, its original color, which I think I used Rainbow I.O. on. I can't remember. We'll, we'll, we'll find out in a second. Um, then let's take a look at the code here. I'll get rid of, uh, let me hide that color wheel. I don't think we need that anymore. And let me open... There we go, there's the code on this. And let's take a look, I can't remember what I'm printing down here. Let's uh, open up. Okay, so yeah, this was kind of the first test of, of things is just this uh, logical key map. So I can, I can call uh, this one zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I just did this kind of Nautilus spiral uh, as far as numbering them. Uh, that is, if we take a look uh, at the setup here, where's the key setup? Did I blow past it? Yep, up at the top. Uh, so number of keys is seven. Uh, Where are my GPIO? <laughs> Am I looking at the code that I think I'm looking at? Where the heck do I set up these keys? Where the heck? There it is. Boy, it was hidden. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, chalk pins. Okay, so I made a, a variable here called chalk pins that contains the pin uh, numbering a zero, a one, two, three, SDA, SCL, TX, RX. So uh, those are connected. Essentially, uh, a one is here, a two is here, a three is here, and so on. Um, so I take that and make a keypad object using the excellent keypad library. Uh, and I'm able to set up what their value is when they're pressed uh, and the pull direction uh, of the pull-up resistor. Um, and then uh, for the 
colors. Okay, I've just set up uh, a set of hues that I liked using that color wheel uh, that I showed earlier. Uh, and if you take a look at the code here, the main loop chalk equals chalk events get. So it just checks and sees has anything happened with the keys, pressed or released. Uh, if so, I grab the number. Uh, so those are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, rather. Uh, if one gets pressed, uh, the sort of first thing I did was just taking a, uh, a look at uh, printing out the key number. So these are the keypad uh, numbers, 0 through 6. Uh, and then I'm also changing the color of the LED, and these are uh, LEDs 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 as well, those match the numbering, uh, to 200 on that color wheel, so that's what gives us this kind of pinkish, purplish color. Uh, and then when I release, I go back to their pre-assigned color that comes from a list. So uh, if we go up here, this is the list of what everyone goes back to. Uh, now, to get into the, the MIDI instrument type of thing, and, and thank you, Charles B. Uh, mentioned uh, isomorphic keyboards. Most of them have 96 keys. Take a look at Linstruments. Um, so I kind of had some vague ideas about isomorphic key, keyboards. I've used some iPad programs that, that are uh, arranged in sort of an isomorphic um, uh, layout, which means essentially a grid of some kind. They can be rectangles, they can be squares, they can be uh, cells of circles or hexes like this. Um, but, but essentially, it's, uh, it's much older than I realized. I did finally look it up last night. Uh, essentially, an accordion keyboard uh, is, is this style of keyboard, which is really to differentiate from something like the piano keyboard. Um, piano has a different shape for every chord in every key. So you kind of have to learn all these different shapes. If you want a major chord in this key, it's going to be differently shaped in this key, differently shaped in this key. Um, isomorphic keyboards attempt to solve this so you don't have to do as much practicing. And if you get used to a certain spacing and, and shape of your fingers, it will move through any uh, interval or any shape, uh, or rather any uh, key that you're in without changing. So you learn shapes and they stay consistent. So this, not really an isomorphic keyboard. It's a, it's a little uh, cell of one, sort of. Um, but I'm, I'm using that term loosely uh, to talk about the idea that um, you can create shapes that sort of repeat, uh, depending on how you set them up, uh, as well as just the idea of this is not a chromatic keyboard. So it doesn't have to be, it can be. Um, so the way I'm, I'm running this is that I've picked some intervals that I like, and I've also picked some modes for chords to happen per key. So um, if we take a, a listen, let me turn up the volume of some oscillators here, and I'll, I'll, I can show this in a minute, but I'm just running um, Vital, which is a, a free and open source synthesizer. Uh, and let me know if that volume is loud enough for you to hear uh, what's going on here. Okay, so if you listen to kind of the, the root note of what's happening here, Okay, we've got seven notes that are filling one octave, but they're not, you know, clearly not 12 semitones. Uh, so there's some choices there about what that root mode is, what that root scale is. Uh, but then the other thing you can, you can hear is that each note isn't playing a single note, but it's also playing a, a chord. All right, so there's, I think, four. I think I have four notes in, in each chord happening here. There's not really a practical limit if you're, if you're playing a polyphonic synthesizer, particularly a software synthesizer. Um, you can have a uh, really huge chords if you want. Um, but I've got four here, just because beyond that it gets a bit cluttered sounding. And the mode that it's in uh, is, and you can see it here, I've got this mode names. Uh, this is largely code that I ripped from my MIDI, MIDI modal keyboard that I made. Uh, there's a learn guide for that I can show you that has um, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico and 21 keys. And, and so it's, it is actually a grid, so a little more 
of that sort of technical isomorphic shape. Um, but right now I'm using the mode uh, minor, aeolian. Uh, so if you listen to that chord, and unfortunately I just have to resave, so it'll take it a minute. If I move this to a major chord here, okay, you can hear the difference from that to the minor. All right, so there's one um, half step uh, difference, semitone difference in one of the notes in there. Um, and so what I have is this definition here of the different modes. So major, minor, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Locrian. You can use other ones if you want to. Those are the ones that I have. Uh, so I can pick any of those and then inside of each of these notes that I'm pressing, it's picking a set of intervals uh, for the chord that are just positions inside of that mode. So those are, I've got the root, uh, the third, the fifth, uh, and then an octave. And that's not like a third, musical third, that's the third item inside of that list. So as you can see here, the third item in the list of a major chord is a fourth, and in the minor chord it's a third. So um, those are the different modes that I have playing inside of those chords. Um, the cool thing with um, these not being semitones is they actually make nice rich sort of chords upon chords if I play two of them at once. Or even three of them at, of them at once. So these are, you know, eight notes being played, so it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's not, uh, not too, too bad. Um, the sort of nature of that is going to change as I pick different modes. So let's go uh, mixolydian in here. What's that? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So if I do the five, and then I immediately type a six. Here we go. Uh, Play the same sort of thing, it'll have a different character to it. Right, it has that more major sound to it uh, with that final res resolution there. Bum. Uh, so you can use them individually. or you can use them in chords. Uh, and if you pick a sort of a root for the key that you want to play in, uh, you set up the sort of uh, intervals of the individual key's root notes, and you pick a mode that you like, you can then just kind of jam inside of uh, a framework, and nothing will sound bad, nothing will sound wrong. You can't hit a bad note. Obviously, it's, it's limited compared to someone who's, you know, a, a, a real keyboard player, has every key at their disposal, knows exactly when they want to play a quote, bad note. Uh, but I don't have those skills, I don't have those chops, so for me it's kind of fun to just have a little noodly. And you start to get a feel of where you can return. Uh, you know, it might make a certain amount of sense to put the, the root of the whole thing in the middle. Uh, that's pretty typical for, for isomorphic keyboards that I've seen. In fact, I wanted to show, um, if, I, if I jump to my browser here, uh, this is just the Wikipedia entry on, uh, hey, Wikipedia entry on isomorphic, isomorphic keyboards. Um, if you look, let's see, at this one here, you can see there are octaves running vertically. So if you look at the D, there's a D3 that's lower by an octave than the D4, which is lower by an octave than the D5. Um, its neighbors are all the sort of same intervals as if you went over to D flat uh, instead of D. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a Casper Wiki's, uh, no relation, Wiki's isomorphic note layout from 1896. Um, so it is not, not a new thing. 
Um, <laughs> C. Grover says, in jazz, you're never more than a half step, step from the perfect note. Yes, right. Actually, I had a jazz vocal uh, uh, teacher in college who was a jazz trumpet player, but he taught, taught a vocal jazz improv class, and he uh, taught us, if you hit a bad note, loop back around, play it again a second time so everyone knows you meant to do it, and then the third time, come around and actually resolve it to where you meant to go, and, and no one's the wiser. So you can, you can flub it. Just remember what you flubbed and come back to it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at these. The, I, I wanted to show one I have on my iPad, but the, whatever, it, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it must not have been updated for more recent iPad versions, iOS versions, because it just crashes a lot now. But they, it has a layout. Um, there, there are a couple of these available. Some of them cost a couple bucks, six bucks. Some of them are free. Um, but if you look at them on iOS, the, there are some nice isomorphic keyboards that let you really understand what it means to, to change the mode, change the root, look at the relationships of neighbors and how a shape can, can transfer around. Um, let's see. Any plans to add a display for which chord you're playing or leave that to the MIDI software? Yeah, you know what? One, one thing I wanted to do was uh, show... Let me, let me bring up the, the software I'm using here. Uh, let's see, I'll add it real quick. Do, do, do. Hopefully this won't crash. Window. Vital. Make this smaller. Uh, so this this is the software I'm using. It has a little um, virtual keyboard at the bottom there, and you can see it. So if I just go uh, to uh, neighboring keys. You can see that the uh, relative interval is shifting uh, between those. And then if I do change, uh, let's, I'll just do this in the code, you won't see it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to a major mode here. So if you look at that arrangement of keys, now watch, one of them is gonna shift the, th the third note you see there is going to shift to the left one when I change the mode to B minor. Sorry, the second, the second one here. Yeah, shifted down one. Uh, so, to answer your question, no, you know, you can do a lot with uh, light stuff. So, especially for bigger things like a Linstrument or or other larger uh, backlit isomorphic keyboards, you can you can do a lot with color where you can see the note that's the root for the key that you're in is pink everywhere. And all of the, let's say, fifths are blue. And, and so you can see these repeating clusters and know if you want to go up an octave, just look for one that's the same color. Um, a little harder to pull off on this little seven key keyboard. So my colors kind of don't mean anything other than I did make these octaves, both this sort of honey uh, amber color. So that's an exact octave transposed uh, of that. Um, the other ones, I just liked the way they look. They don't mean too much. Uh, you could certainly do like a display of some kind, add a little uh, readout, a little um, OLED display or TFT or something like that to this. Uh, I just am, am starting out with this really simple one. I, you can see I don't have any... Uh, control for it. One thing I did with the modal MIDI keyboard was when I um, started it, it, it waited for you to enter the key that was your root and the mode. So that was a nice way to not add any um, buttons or knobs or anything, but just to hit reset and then tell it by, you know, picking one of one of these keys, that's going to be the root. And then you had choices. Uh, the, the second set of choices was what mode you're in. Uh, so that's something I could put on this pretty easily. Uh, or you could add a knob 
if you, if you added like a rotary encoder, you could like move your way through a couple of choices since we've got the little click encoders. That could be a, a kind of fun add-on for something like this. Um, and Lamar actually said, hey, what about putting a button in the middle? But those tend to stand up pretty high and, and it would make it kind of funny to, to navigate around this. Uh, and I like having the seven seven keys there, so I don't know if I'd want to lose one for, for a button. But, um, you know, you could get silly, not silly, you could get fancy uh, with accelerometers and things like during startup, have it in one position or another to pick things, maybe have the six uh, hex positions to pick a mode. Um, and then you could also use that for pitch bend or CC or something like that later. Um, let's see, what other questions and thoughts do we have? Let me bring up the, uh, the Discord chat here. Um, hmm. Todd says, I think you can still refer to it as isomorphic, but lean into it being radially isomorphic instead of grid isomorphic. Okay, good. That's a good clarification. Uh, yeah, put a gyro in it and rotation lets you change the root note. Love it. Um, Andy Calloway, I'm sorry you said you're tone deaf, so maybe this is all incredibly boring to you. I apologize. Uh, And yes, the address for the isomorphic keyboard thing. Yeah, slide input on the side. Yeah, you could definitely add some little, little uh, UI bits and pieces. Um, I'll probably, uh, I'm going to be working with Noe on a, uh, sorry, I'm not showing it right now, on a little guide for building this. Um, you can... Um, it will just have a simple little case for it and you'll be able to use it for anything you want because this could be just a, a number, a keypad for macros, calculator for people who are dealing in seven digits only, I don't know. Uh, but you could, you could use this for uh, USB uh, input as well as uh, USB HID as well as USB MIDI. Uh, you could also add, if you wanted to do uh, sort of more conventional uh, TRS MIDI, uh, classic serial UART MIDI, you could add... Um, an output for that as well, not, not too difficult. Uh, you just gotta find two pins, or actually, you're only outputting, so you just gotta find one pin. I think we have a pin or two free. Uh, we also have Stemma QT on this um, QT Pi here, so you can add, if you wanna put a rotary encoder on there or something like that, we just grab one of these guys here and, and plug that off into the side. Uh, oh, thanks for, Charles B asks, how'd you get the shape of the hex keypads? I bought them, but I wanted to show you uh, the, let me find the, uh, this is a great web page. So the uh, process here for these, um, I'm going to put this link in the chat because I think it's really interesting. These were um, originally 3D printed during the development by the maker here, I think, uh, maybe as a resin printed thing, but these got, these got um, molds made and are commercially available keycaps. Um, and this is a great blog post that I put in the, over in the, uh, the Discord chat, I put it in the YouTube chat too, uh, about the process for building these. Uh, that I think some links, or you can search for them, uh, but I think there's some links up on the top about uh, where to buy them. They are sold out most places. I think there's one European seller, uh, maybe in the Netherlands, who's still got some in stock. I assume these will come back into stock, but Noe is making a 3D printable uh, version of it. I think he might have found a model and cleaned it up or, or just built one. Um, so he's got a, uh, a uh, 3D printed one that you'll be able to uh, make for yourself if you want to. The, let's see, does this say where you can get them? Let me, let me see, it was uh, FK, FK Caps is the uh, company who's selling these, or is, is, is making them, uh, and then you can buy them at Little Keyboards, that's where I got them, or Split KB, uh, and they are in stock, and I think they're in the Netherlands. Uh, they'll ship, I think they'll ship internationally, just cost a little bit. 
uh, but they're very reasonable. They're something like, what, less than six pounds for 10 of them. I think it was $4.50 for 10 of them from little keyboards. Uh, and there's this also this one, mkultra.click. Uh, I think they are also sold out right now. Uh, oh, gosh, maybe they're not carrying them anymore. But if you click on little keyboards, you might be able, yeah, you can click on notify me um, and have them. By the way, I don't know if it was a mistake or they knew what I was up to, but when I ordered, I, I was able to order two packs of 10 from Little Keyboards. They didn't send me 20. They sent me 21, which is perfect because I'm using seven per keyboard here. Uh, so that makes three of them. I'm sending a, a set to Noe, so he has a, a reference set as he's doing his 3D printed ones. Um, so that's, uh, that was very kind of them or an excellent uh, fortuitous error that they accidentally threw one extra. I don't think it was an error though. So thank you, uh, littlekeyboards.com. I don't know you, but you made me happy. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, speaking of, uh, of making people happy, I did want to remind you that you can get uh, 10% off, not there, but here in this store right here. Hey, get yourself some reverse mount NeoPixels if you want. <laughs> Andy Calloway, you are seen. I felt seen. Uh, Type in Honeycomb on your way out uh, of the Adafruit store and you'll get 10% off of your order. Uh, and I'll also remind you, if you order a bunch of stuff, there are deals to be had. So if your order is $99 or more, you're going to get a free Permaproto half-size uh, breadboard, PCB. If you order $149 or more, you will get a KB2040. And uh, I believe that time is running out on getting these limited edition pink KB2040s. They're going to be returning to their black color soon. Uh, but if you, if you get one now, either just buy it in the store or place an order of $149 or more and get your free one, it should be pink. Uh, and those are limited. You, by the way, get stacking freebies. So if you place the $299 order, you'll get a BBC Micro Bit version 2 for free. You'll get free U.S. Uh, ground shipping from UPS. Uh, you'll get the KB2040 and you'll get the Permaproto. So all those stack. Uh, and I believe you can use uh, the the 10% off and still get this. You just have to clear, I think you have to clear that 299 if that's what you're going for after uh, after the discount. That's my guess. I don't know that for sure, but that's usually how those things work, right? Uh, yeah, so Honeycomb, type that in. That'll get you 10% off. And uh, I think that's going to do it for today. So... Thank you, everyone, for stopping by. It's been great hanging out with you. Uh, I am going to try to finish up painting and, uh, and adding the uh, ports to the keyboard. You can see here I've drilled out a couple holes on top. I'm going to put a nice big uh, USB-C uh, panel mount port there so you can plug into there to, to power the thing and, and run your USB MIDI. Uh, and the uh, USB, or rather the TRS MIDI will go there so you can run classic synths. I may see if we can run it off a of battery for those cases so you don't have to be plugged in if you're, if you're just using it for TRS MIDI. I, I uh, should be able to. I think we got four double A's in there and I can also put that little uh, boost in there if I need to. So uh, Probably get away without it though. I think we'll get away without it. All right. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for stopping by. For Adafruit Industries, I'm John Park. This has been John Park's Workshop, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.